Welcome to Resource Efficient Scotland's Energy Efficiency Technical E-Modules. This E-Module forms part of the decarbonisation of heat generation modules and considers the application of biomass. Please note that module users working in a healthcare environment should always refer to the relevant Scottish Health Technical Memorandum for Biomass prior to considering installation of the measures suggested here. The advice given in the memorandum may conflict with the advice given in the module. The relevant memorandum for biomass can be found on the Health Facility Scotland website. Part 1 – Learning Objectives and Outcomes This e-module is designed for public sector energy managers who want to know more about heat generation using biomass. The e-module will be split into several smaller parts each of which you can go through and review at your convenience. We will also provide some links to references and resources for more information. It is assumed that you have some familiarity with the technology and this presentation provides an overview of the main technical and financial considerations when looking to install a biomass boiler. The objectives of this module is for you to gain sufficient understanding to carry out evaluations on the suitability of this technology in various applications and understand how to evaluate the financial viability of projects utilising this low carbon heating technology. At the end there will be a short quiz which will give you the opportunity to check your understanding and test what you have learned. To achieve these overall objectives you will be able to Describe the main biomass boiler technologies. Outline the benefits of biomass. Be able to assess site suitability for biomass. Be able to consider all fuel and technology requirements for installing a biomass boiler. And understand the key aspects in relation to biomass boiler projects when building a business case. Part 2 – Rationale for Biomass Boilers Let us first consider why you would choose to install a biomass boiler. The Scottish Government, through the Renewable Heat Action Plan for Scotland, has set a target of 11% of heat consumed in Scotland to be generated by renewable sources by 2020. Biomass heat sources can play an important part in achieving that goal. The Climate Change Scotland Act 2009 introduced ambitious targets and legislation to reduce Scotland's emissions by at least 80% by 2050. All public sector bodies in Scotland have duties under the Act to reduce carbon emissions in line with the emissions reduction targets. Heating accounts for a large element of the direct carbon emissions of many public sector bodies, so biomass heating can make a significant contribution to the achievement of these targets. There are several reasons why an organisation may consider installing a biomass boiler. It may be for carbon reduction. Biomass is a zero carbon fuel. Note that biomass is considered to be a zero carbon fuel because the carbon emitted from combustion is offset by the carbon consumed in growing the biomass. There is still a small carbon footprint associated with harvest, fuel preparation and transportation. The status of biomass as a zero carbon fuel can be challenged for feedstock not produced in a sustainable manner, especially when tree replanting after harvest does not occur. This makes sustainability an important part of the carbon neutral status. Another consideration is financial reasons. There are financial incentives available. In addition, the future cost of biomass is not linked to fossil fuel prices and may inflate at a lower rate. Another consideration is boiler replacement. It may be that an existing boiler needs to be replaced. And lastly, you can source fuel locally. You can source biomass fuel locally from within Scotland and in this way, the money spent on fuel is retained in the local economy. Let's look at these in a little more detail. 
correctly managed, biomass can deliver a significant reduction in net carbon emissions when compared with fossil fuels. The amount of carbon reduced will depend on the source of the biomass and how it is processed. We will talk about this later in section 4. There are financial rewards for saving carbon, including reduction of the climate change levy, or CCL, which is charged on purchases of gas, LPG and electricity. Reduction of payments under the Carbon Reduction Commitment Energy Efficiency Scheme, or CRC. The CRC scheme is a mandatory carbon emissions reporting and pricing scheme to cover all organisations in the UK using more than 6,000 megawatt hours of electricity per year. The scheme is managed on behalf of the UK Government's Department of Energy and Climate Change, or DEC, by the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. And finally, there is a financial reward for very large energy users who are part of the EU Emissions Trading Scheme, known as the EU ETS. There are a number of financial reasons to consider installing a biomass boiler. The cost of heat from biomass can be lower than the cost of heat produced by the current electricity, oil or LPG systems. In the future, the cost of biomass can be expected to inflate at a lower rate compared to fossil fuels, further improving this cost differential. The market for biomass has been transformed by the introduction of the Renewable Heat Incentive, known as the RHI. This is the world's first incentive scheme for renewable heat. For eligible installations, the RHI offers a payment for each unit of eligible renewable heat consumed. Details of the RHI payment are given in Section 8, the benefits of installation. Biomass systems are often considered when life-expired boiler systems are being replaced as at this time capital options need to be assessed and the financial, operational and carbon impacts of different boiler systems need to be evaluated. Biomass systems can be designed to generate heat at a range of temperatures, pressures and flow rates. This means that biomass can be integrated within existing heating systems without major modification of the heat distribution system. Heating controls may need adjustment as the biomass system is best suited to provide the base load source of heat in a given application. We will talk about this later in section 3. Biomass fuel can be sourced locally from within Scotland on an indefinite basis. This provides security of supply. Some organisations consider it a benefit to source fuel close to where it is used providing local economic benefits through the fuel supply chain. In addition, sourcing fuel locally allows for the financial and environmental costs of transport to be minimised. Biomass suppliers are based all over Scotland and it is possible to purchase fuel to supply most sites locally. This section will describe the components of biomass systems including the boiler, fuel store, fuel delivery mechanism, heat buffer tank, etc. We will also address issues relating to boiler operating efficiency, flue design, maintenance and space requirements. We're going to look at the fundamental design of the biomass boiler, fuel and fuel handling, boiler sizing and buffer tanks, maintenance, flue design and space requirements. Broadly speaking, biomass systems are similar in design and operation to those used in the past for coal. Biomass has been successfully used across a wide range of applications, including many public sector buildings. Successful installations recognise that biomass systems behave differently to oil and gas fuel systems. The key principles for success include understanding that biomass fuels are natural products, 
This means that their characteristics vary with wide variations across the range of different types of biomass, i.e. wood chips and pellets, and smaller variations for the same type of fuel. The key variables are moisture content and particle size. Another principle is that boilers are designed to operate efficiently with a specific fuel specification. Matching and checking that the fuel supply meets the boiler specification is key to success. Another factor is that biomass fuel needs to be stored on site and transferred to the boiler. This will need the provision of fuel storage and fuel handling systems. These take up space and need to be designed to match the physical characteristics of the fuel chosen in order to avoid blockages. And finally, biomass boilers do not react to rapid changes in heat demand, as combustion of the solid fuels cannot change as rapidly as the combustion of gas or oil. So biomass boilers are best operated at steady or slowly changing levels of output. This may necessitate the use of a buffer tank, also known as a heat store. Biomass fuels all have some degree of moisture within them. To deal with this, a biomass boiler has a refractory lining and the combustion chamber is designed such that the fuel entering goes through a drying zone created by reflected heat before it is burnt. Using this approach, it is possible to burn even very wet fuels, that's 50% moisture or more, by using a large combustion chamber with a large drying zone and extensive refractory lining. Of course, the drying process uses energy, leading to a lower overall boiler efficiency when wetter fuels are used. This need for space within the combustion chamber for fuel drying, combined with the low energy density of biomass compared to fossil fuels, is the reason why biomass boilers are considerably larger than similarly rated fossil fuel systems. The combustion of wood involves initial gasification of the fuel, such that the combustion occurs above and not within the fuel bed. Oversupply of air is essential to ensure complete combustion occurs. The fuel feed process requires addition of the fuel in response to the heat demand. Screw augers can provide accurate control of fuel feed and are most often used in smaller systems where fuel feed rate is critical. Larger systems use chain or conveyor systems as used in coal boilers. All fuel feed systems incorporate devices to prevent fire spreading into the fuel feed system and then into the feed hopper. Many biomass boilers include automatic ignition. This usually involves heating an electrical element and blowing the hot gases into a small area of fuel until it combusts. We'll start by going through all the elements of a typical biomass system. A biomass system consists of a fuel reception area, a fuel store where the fuel must be kept dry, a fuel delivery mechanism for getting the fuel from the store to the boiler, the biomass boiler itself, and usually a buffer tank or heat store. The choice of boiler, fuel store and delivery system all depend upon what type of biomass fuel is being burnt. This means that one of the first and most important decisions you will have to make when considering a biomass boiler system is what form of biomass fuel to use. A biomass boiler burns organic matter that is either grown as a fuel or from a clean waste stream such as the unwanted branches when a tree is harvested. For small and medium size installations, up to around one megawatt, there are three main types of fuel. Unprocessed fuel, such as wood logs or straw bales, wood chips and wood pellets. For larger installations, wood chip or wood pellets are the main types of fuel. Unprocessed fuels, such as logs or straw bales, are usually used in simpler batch-fed systems. 
They're mainly manually fed and supply a large heat store, making them less suitable to many applications. There are many types of energy crops which can be used as biomass fuel, such as Mithcanthus grass and short rotation coppice, grown as a farm crop. Most biomass in Scotland will come from wood that is co-produced when wood trees are harvested. This is so-called brash, comprises branches and treetops, which is few other markets. Other sources are from thinning undertaken as part of woodland management, or from the removal of poor quality trees prior to replanting. These biomass sources are either made into fuels by processing it into pellets, by first drying and grinding the material prior to compression, or are simply chipped and used. Alternative fuels can come from diverse sources such as seaweed or other biomass waste streams such as crop byproducts. If you're considering one of these alternative fuels, you must use a biomass boiler and fuel handling system that is designed for them. You should also consider any long-term fuel supply risks. This is important as each boiler will be tested and a certificate produced which sets out what type of fuel it can burn in order for UK air quality standards to be met. The RHI scheme will require you to use a fuel which meets the specification for your boiler set out in the emissions certificate. For instance, it is typical for a log boiler to need a fuel of below 20% moisture content if it is to meet air quality requirements. Forestry Commission Scotland have created a website dedicated to providing information on the use of wood fuel. It can be found at www.usewoodfuel.co.uk Different fuels require different levels of intervention and the point at which this intervention is required also varies with fuel type. Different biomass types have different processing requirements to turn it into useful fuel and these have different costs associated with them. Wood logs are cheaper than wood chips for example and chips are cheaper than wood pellets. While there is an obvious advantage in buying cheaper fuel this has implications elsewhere in the process. For instance, pellets are in effect an engineered fuel that comes in a standard size and at a standard moisture content, and as a result the biomass systems to use them can be cheaper. Chip is more variable in both size and moisture content, leading to more costly boiler and fuel feed systems. Logs have the same variation in terms of size and moisture content and in addition they almost always need some form of hand feeding or batch loading but the boilers to use them are usually simple and low cost. As a result these are the practical considerations that you must make. Do I want an automatic or manual fuel feed system? If I choose automatic fuel feed do I want a lower cost pellet system and a high cost fuel, or a higher cost chip fed system and cheaper fuel? If I chose chips or logs, can the fuel be sourced at a low enough moisture content to meet the air quality requirements, or will it need to dry further? How will the fuel be delivered to site? How will the fuel be stored? How will the fuel be fed to the boiler? And how often will the boiler need manual input? In the next few slides, we'll explain the interventions with respect to the different biomass fuels. In their most simple form, wood logs come in three meter lengths of timber, but a supplier can cut them to shorter lengths by arrangement. The wood would usually be delivered by lorry in loads of around 25 tonnes. The moisture content of these is very variable and can be 60% or higher at the point of harvest. High moisture content decreases the efficiency of combustion, 
so logs often need to be stored for several months to dry. This is known as seasoning before they can be burned. Round logs must be handled using heavy machinery and the boiler will often need to be started manually. Log based systems tend to be small scale only, typically 20 to 500 kilowatts thermal and involve batch fed boilers. There are semi-automatic systems where logs can be loaded into a hopper and automatically loaded into the boiler when required. In these systems, heat may be transferred to a buffer or storage tank, allowing hot water to be used on demand. Wood is typically used in the round, i.e. whole wood logs, only on agricultural sites where there is a large amount of space available, the machinery is already on site to handle whole logs, and personnel are on site who can attend to the boiler. Larger sites can often burn bales of brash from timber harvesting, provided the boiler is designed to do so. Small or medium sized installations use split logs, which are cut into lengths of 300 mm to 500 mm. It is common for wood to be delivered after it has been seasoned or kiln dried. However, the moisture content of split logs can be quite variable and achieving moisture content of less than 20% needs either a very long time to season, up to around 24 months, or kiln drying. Once the wood is sufficiently dried, it will require careful storage. Split logs need to be taken from the log store to the boiler manually, where the boiler will often need to be started manually. Biomass boiler systems which burn wood chips require less manual intervention compared to those which burn wood logs. Wood chips can be produced from virgin timber, from sawmill offcuts, waste wood or from brash. The chemical properties of the wood will vary according to where it is sourced from and this will affect characteristics of the ash produced. Sawmill offcuts and brash contain proportionally more bark and this will increase the amount of ash produced. The type of ash produced is important. Ash with a lower melting temperature than the boiler is designed for can cause clinker to form. Ash that melts or fuses is known as clinker. Clinker can block or damage the inside of the boiler by coating surfaces and allowing hot spots to form. This is a particular problem with straw fuel and is another reason why using different biomass fuels can be problematic. Wood is chipped to a prescribed maximum size. The size of the chips is important as fuel delivery systems are designed to take specific size ranges and oversized chips will block fuel delivery mechanisms such as augers which will require intervention to rectify. The wood chips are then dried to a prescribed moisture content. Different boilers are capable of burning wood chips at different maximum moisture contents. This is dependent upon the design of the boiler but a maximum moisture content of about 30% would be typical for many installations of 500 kilowatts or less. We now need to consider how to get the wood chip into a wood store. The most common delivery method for wood chips is using a tipper lorry. These lorries may require either an underground fuel store or a store at a lower level than the road supporting the lorry. Alternatively, they can tip into a barn type store if it is large enough and a front loader may be used to move chips on site. It is also possible to chip wood on site. Climate change over the next few decades is likely to result in different weather patterns and conditions in Scotland. This may lead to increased and new risks from flooding within the lifetime of a biomass plant and may need to be considered when siting an underground fuel store. The following should be considered when considering an underground fuel store. The distances from the boundary of the site to waterways and water bodies. 
the existence of groundwater, coastal water or nature protection areas, the geological or hydrological conditions in the area and the risk of flooding or subsidence on the site. Wood chips are usually delivered by lorry, most of which are fitted with some form of tipping trailer. Fuel can either be tipped directly into the fuel store, if it is large enough to accept a whole trailer of fuel, or placed into a storage area and then transferred to the feed hopper by front end loader. Fuel stores can be underground, but most commonly they comprise hoppers, such as the one shown in the slide. This kind of hopper may require pneumatic transfer wood chip from a specialist delivery vehicle or by a high lift bucket loader. It is also possible to use a mechanism such as a walking floor, where the wood chips are tipped onto the floor of a large shed and a moving floor carries the chips either further into the store or onto a conveyor to deliver the chips to the boiler. Such plant equipment introduces significant capital and space requirements and therefore tend to be more common on larger capacity installations, for example boilers of 1 megawatt or more. Once the fuel is in your fuel store, it needs to be transferred to the boiler. For wood chips, this typically involves automatic fuel delivery mechanisms controlled in relation to the demand from the boiler. In these systems, the boiler ignites automatically and the system may also be designed for automatic ash removal. We will look at this further when we cover maintenance. The most common mechanisms for taking the fuel from the store to the boiler in larger systems are conveyor belts, including drag link conveyors. These can be fed by a rotary agitator or a walking floor. A rotary agitator consists of four arms which extend out of a central hub. As the hub rotates, the arms push the wood pellets onto the conveyor or auger. The arms extend as the fuel store becomes empty. In smaller systems, a screw auger conveyor is more commonly used. This comprises a mechanism that uses a rotating blade, usually within a tube, to move the wood chips. Stores for wood chips must have a flat solid base. Wood chips can form overhangs and cavities when fuel delivery mechanisms take fuel from the base of the store, with the overlapping wood chips effectively forming a bridge over the gap created. For this reason, it is not appropriate to design fuel stores for wood chips with a V-shaped base. It is important to store the wood chip to allow air to circulate without letting in too much moisture. Good storage practice will minimise degradation of the chip in store and decrease the fire hazard. Wood pellets are the most straightforward biomass fuel to use and allow the highest levels of plant automation. However, they are also the most expensive. The pellets are manufactured from compressed sawdust, which may be produced from a variety of feedstock and are manufactured to a specified size and moisture content. The pellets are usually 6 mm or 8 mm diameter for small systems, however larger systems can use pellets of 10 mm or 12 mm diameter. The length is generally less than 40 mm and the moisture content between 6 and 10 percent by weight. There are agreed standards for wood pellet production in Europe. This is known as EN 14961, which is represented by the EN plus A1 or A2 standards. These determine factors such as the length of the pellet and the moisture content, as well as the amount of ash generated. As a rule, A1 pellets will come from stem wood with the bark removed, while A2 pellets will include bark and therefore produce more ash, with the ash produced melting at a lower temperature. The EN 14961 standard was introduced in 2011 
and includes many of the requirements of EN+, but not all. The most important issue to be aware of is that wood pellets, when produced to EN+, or EN14961 Part 2 standard, will be of a consistent quality, which prevents many of the operating problems associated with wood chip or logs. Due to their form, wood pellets will tend to flow more readily than wood chip. As a result, wood pellet fuel stores have a V-shaped base, usually of around 35 degrees, falling to a central auger. This arrangement allows pellets to flow towards the auger, which then takes the pellets directly to the boiler. If the angle of drain from the store is incorrect, the pellets may become interlocked, which blocks flow. It is also possible to use augers to lift pellets vertically, on an incline, or horizontally. Wood pellets must be stored dry under cover. Their low moisture content means that they will not degrade like wood chips, but they are prone to break up if over or incorrectly handled. On smaller sites, prefabricated fuel silos can be erected inside a building with the fuel delivery connections mounted on the outside of the wall. On larger systems, an external fuel silo would tend to be used. Wood pellets are often delivered pneumatically, directly from a lorry into a fuel store, negating the need for a reception mechanism. It is important that the wood pellets are not damaged during delivery. Pellets can be damaged when delivered at high pressure. This causes them to split when they hit the inside of the store, which results in sawdust being fed into the boiler instead of the pellets. It takes longer to deliver the wood pellets at the correct velocity instead of the maximum velocity a delivery vehicle is capable of. It is therefore important to monitor deliveries to ensure the pellets are delivered correctly. The Scottish Government has developed a biomass wood fuel pellet supply framework for public bodies who are purchasing biomass wood pellets. The framework only covers wood fuel in the form of pellets. Biomass wood chip, animal biomass and plant biomass are out of the scope. To deliver the carbon benefits highlighted earlier, it is important that biomass fuels are grown, harvested, processed and transported in ways that minimise carbon and the other impacts. The administrator for the RHI, that's Ofgem, is introducing a biomass suppliers list, known as the BSL, in April 2015, which will assess and accredit the sustainability of suppliers. In the near future, the BSL will be used to provide RHI participants with a simple way to demonstrate that their fuel complies with the RHI standards. Next, we will touch upon the health and safety issues relating to biomass boiler installations. If biomass fuel, for example wood chips and wood pellets, is allowed to get wet and is stored wet for long periods, then there is a risk that it starts to degrade, resulting in the release of heat. If left unchecked, this build-up can lead to the fuel pile spontaneously combusting. Ensuring fuel is kept dry can prevent this. Incorrect handling of wood pellets can cause them to break down into fine wood dust, which in turn present the potential for dust fires or explosions. This risk can be managed by ensuring that systems are designed to avoid the breaking up of pellets and accumulation of wood dust, including good housekeeping and controlling sources of ignition. So let's summarise biomass fuel. It is worth considering whether the practicalities of your site are more suited to wood pellets, wood chips or wood logs. One key aspect to consider is to what degree the operation of the site is suited to manual handling. Wood pellet biomass boilers can operate for a month or more without an intervention compared to other fuels. Whilst large wood chip systems can do likewise, 
there are more frequent operational issues and more machinery is required, but the fuel cost is lower than pellets. Wood log boilers, in turn, require constant intervention, but the capital cost is considerably lower. It is important to be aware of the fuel available in your area and how many suppliers are available. It is important that you know where your long-term sustainable supply will come from. Finally, it's important to consider the health and safety implications of biomass fuel deliveries and biomass fuel stores in deciding whether they are appropriate for your site. Biomass boilers take longer to heat up and cool down than fossil fuel boilers and are less able to modulate their output to meet the required heat load. The design of a system which uses a biomass boiler must take this into account. If the biomass boiler is required to start up frequently and operate for short periods, then it will be inefficient, more likely to break down and will require more regular maintenance and will not last as long. There are two strategies to address this. On sites where there is fossil fuel available, the biomass boiler and fossil boilers can be designed to work together such that the biomass boiler is sized to meet the base load for the site and fossil fuel boilers are used to meet the remaining or peak demand. Or on sites where the biomass boiler is the only heat generating plant, a buffer tank can be used to even out the peaks and troughs of heat demand. Both of these strategies require an assessment of the peak heat load and assessment of the heat demand during the year. Before biomass boilers are considered, it is also advisable to consider energy efficiency measures that will decrease heat demand. Each of these strategies are considered in the next two slides. The configuration of biomass and fossil fuel boilers working together has two main benefits. Firstly, if a fossil fuel backup system is used, then the kilowatt rating of the biomass boiler can be reduced accordingly, as it will not be providing the sole source of heat. And secondly, it ensures that the heat load is sufficient most of the time for the biomass boiler to operate between 30% and 100% of its maximum output, which ensures that it operates as efficiently as possible. A buffer tank could also be used to meet peaks in demand and ensure that the biomass boiler provides as much of the load as possible. The role of the buffer tank is discussed in the next slide. It can take from 45 minutes to 2 hours for a medium sized biomass boiler to heat up and up to 24 hours for a very large biomass boiler to heat up. The time taken depends on the fuel used and the boiler design. As a general rule, those boilers that are designed for dry fuel, such as wood pellets, have less refractory lining and therefore take less time to reach operating temperature. The higher the moisture content of the fuel that a boiler can handle, the longer it is likely to take to heat up and cool down. This inherent lag in output can be overcome by including thermal store or buffer tank in the biomass system. The buffer tank works at three key stages in the operation of the boiler, as shown on the slide. For example, it can be possible for a biomass boiler of 30% of peak output to meet 95% of total annual consumption by using a sufficiently large buffer tank. An intelligent control system can manage the output of the boiler and the storage capacity of the buffer tank to maximise the efficiency of the system. Such a system would typically have five or more sensors at different heights in the buffer tank. A less intelligent controller with only two sensors will not be capable of controlling the biomass boiler output as accurately and will need a larger buffer tank. So, when specifying a biomass boiler system, the boiler, buffer tank and control system must be selected to work together to meet the heating requirements of the system they serve. 
Fossil fuel boilers are traditionally sized by calculating the maximum heating requirement of the building they serve and selecting a boiler which is capable of providing at least this much heat. The calculation of the maximum space heating requirement of a building generally involves selecting a design outside temperature, the temperature which is exceeded 98% of the time would be typical, and a design inside temperature, for example 20 degrees C. The insulation properties of the building will then need to be assessed. This is done by measuring the area of each building element, such as walls, windows and roof. The insulation value for each element is known as the U-value. The U-value will be specified for new buildings. For older buildings, it is not always possible to find out exactly how they were constructed or what insulation properties they have. For recently constructed properties, it is often assumed that the property was constructed to meet building regulations. The area of each element is then multiplied by U-value and the difference between inside and outside temperatures to determine the amount of heat that it will lose under those conditions. The total heat loss through all these building elements is referred to as the fabric heat loss. The ventilation heat loss can also be calculated. This calculation takes into account the volume of the building and the ventilation rate. For new buildings, the ventilation rate may be specified. For healthcare facilities, refer to the Scottish Health Technical Memorandum 03-01 Ventilation for Healthcare Premises. Or a test may have been done to identify the infiltration rate for building compliance and the performance of known ventilation systems. For older buildings, the ventilation rate will usually be assumed, taking into account the building's age, use and any ventilation system. Finally, the thermal bridging needs to be quantified. This is where heat is lost through the join between two building elements, such as around a window or a door frame. Sizing of a biomass boiler is different because, as indicated earlier, biomass boilers are more efficient when operated continuously. When sizing a biomass boiler for space heating, it is essential to understand the peak load requirements. But as we have discussed already, simply selecting a boiler to meet these requirements will likely result in an inefficient system. Instead, it is preferential to use a smaller biomass boiler with a conventional boiler picking up the peak heating requirement or by using a thermal store as a buffer. The relative sizing of the biomass and conventional boilers will be determined according to the heat load profile for the building served. To understand the heat load profile, consider how a care home and an office are heated. A care home is kept at a constant temperature all day and all night. The amount of heat required will depend on the outside temperature and how much heat is generated inside the building by other sources. Consider an office with working hours from 9 in the morning to 5 in the evening. The heating system comes on at 6am to heat up the building from cold. Between 6am and 9am the building gradually heats up, absorbing heat in the process. From 8.30, the building will fill up rapidly with people. Computers, lights and other equipment are turned on and heat is generated. These sources of heat are referred to as internal gains. This means that the building may need less heat. During the winter months, the building will need heat all day. During the spring and autumn months, the building may require a limited amount of heat and the building may overheat during the summer months. The building will require no heat between 5pm and 6am and has an intense period of heat consumption between 6am and 9am. The building will have a lower requirement for heat, dependent on the time of year, between 9am and 5pm. A care home is well suited to a biomass boiler due to the continual need to heat the building and the slow changes in heat demand. The office is less suitable for a biomass boiler. If a biomass boiler was installed, 
a buffer tank would be required and the boiler size would have to be carefully selected. These heat use profiles are very important to the sizing of the boiler and the use of buffer systems or additional fossil fuel boilers. It is important to do a thorough heat survey to ensure that the data is available for the heating engineer to design the system appropriately. This section has examined the strategies for sizing a boiler and buffer tank and set out the operational and financial importance of selecting the correct size of biomass boiler, fossil fuel backup boiler and buffer tank. It is very important that buffer tanks are sized in conjunction with the boiler, that they are not sized on a rule of thumb basis based on the boiler size, and that the use of the building they serve is taken into account. Finally, the size of the buffer tank required will depend upon how the boiler is controlled. An intelligent control system can manage the output of the boiler and the storage capacity of the buffer tank to ensure maximum efficiency of the system whereas a less intelligent controller will not be capable of controlling the boiler output as accurately, therefore requiring a larger buffer tank. In this section, we will discuss the need for maintaining biomass boilers. Biomass boilers burn solid fuel and therefore generate more ash than an oil or gas boiler. This ash must be removed from the boiler to ensure that the heat is efficiently transferred. Ash can also cause corrosion problems by mixing with any condensate which forms inside the boiler and generating an acid. If ash is allowed to build up, then hot spots can form which can damage the boiler. So it is very important to keep the boiler clean. We have already discussed the different levels of automation that are possible from different fuels. The cleaning of biomass boilers can also be automated to some extent, although they will always require more work to operate than fossil fuel boilers. The fuel store and fuel handling machinery are mechanical systems that will incur wear and tear, so these elements will require maintenance from the supplier or other qualified providers. The heat exchanger in a boiler consists of a series of tubes through which the hot combustion gases pass, heating the surrounding water. Many wood pellet and wood chip boilers use items known as turbulators to keep these tubes clean. These function by inducing turbulent flow of combustion gases to reduce the rate at which ash is deposited onto the tube walls. For larger systems, compressed air is used to remove ash deposits from the heat exchangers. Such systems can reduce the frequency of ash removal, but do not do away with the need for it entirely. Boilers which are consistently operating at low outputs will tend to need cleaning more frequently than those which operate between their minimum and maximum output most of the time. Biomass boilers require a flue or chimney to draw flue gases through the plant and disperse these gases to atmosphere at a safe level. When considering a biomass boiler system, it is essential to consider the flue that will be required. A flue will often require planning permission and will be judged on physical appearance as well as function. When considering an application for planning permission, an environmental health officer will assess the impact on local air quality. There are some areas where air quality is a specific concern and additional requirements are in place to manage air pollution. These are known as air quality management areas, usually referred to as AQMAs. Not every AQMA has the same restriction in place and so if your site is in an AQMA then it is important to check what substances are of concern. In making their decision, the environmental health officer will require evidence that the flue has been designed to sufficiently disperse gases such as nitrogen oxide, nitrogen dioxide and particulates. Wood contains a lot of nitrogen and in burning wood more nitrogen compounds are generated than fossil fuel boilers. 
In granting permission for a boiler, the Environmental Health Officer may require particular measures are incorporated into the scheme. For example, ceramic filters or electrostatic precipitators designed to reduce particular emissions. The requirements for biomass flues are different for each local authority area, so it is important that these are checked. Since biomass is a solid fuel, it also generates a lot more particulates than natural gas or oil. Ensuring the dispersal requires a combination of actions that may include ensuring that the velocity of the flue gases is more than 6 meters per second, making the flue higher than any surrounding structure by at least 2 meters, and installing devices to remove particulates from the flue gases. There are a number of ways to remove particulates from exhaust gases. Cyclones are the cheapest and most common. These operate by spinning the flue gases very quickly, causing the heavier particles to migrate to the outside of the cyclone vessel before being deposited in the base of the cyclone. The disadvantage of such systems is that they do not remove the smallest particles. This requires the addition of a ceramic filter or an electrostatic precipitator. These can add considerable cost to a system, but may allow a biomass boiler to be installed where it would not normally be permitted. So by this point we have considered what fuel you will use and what impact this has on how often you will need to interact with a boiler. We have considered how to determine what requirements you have for heat and how this can be used to determine the most appropriate boiler and buffer tank combination. We have considered how often you will need to maintain the boiler and what flue will be required. The final consideration is deciding how much space you will need. Biomass boilers are generally much larger than gas boilers. But the size does not increase linearly as the output capacity of the boiler increases. Most manufacturers produce a range of boilers of the same or similar physical size, for example 100 kilowatts to 200 kilowatts, within a standard boiler case, with only the next size range up of boilers likely to be significantly larger, both in terms of footprint and height. It is important to leave sufficient space around the boiler to allow it to be maintained. Each boiler is different, and while some only need access on two sides for maintenance, there are others which require access on all sides. Buffer tanks also take up a lot of space. Even the smallest biomass system will likely require a tank of 2,000 litres. It's not uncommon for larger systems to require a buffer of more than 10,000 litres and district heating schemes may require a buffer of more than 100,000 litres, normally in the form of multiple buffer tanks. The fuel you choose to burn and how much fuel you wish to store on site will affect how large a fuel store you need. The most important consideration when considering how much fuel you need to store on site is the length of time between deliveries. Rural sites need particular consideration. Finally, you should consider how the size of the fuel delivery you're able to order will affect the amount paid for any fuel. A delivery of wood pellets of more than 10 tonnes is often considerably cheaper than a delivery of less than 10 tonnes. A lot of sites lack sufficient space to install a biomass system within an existing building or boiler room. It is possible to purchase a biomass system in a prefabricated plant room, ready to be connected to your existing system. These can be in the form of modified shipping containers or prefabricated buildings. These prefabricated units can also include a fuel store or can be connected to a fuel silo. As a guide, a plant room for a 200 kW biomass boiler buffer tank and a 20 meter cubed fuel store would typically be around 3 meters by 3 meters by 9 meters. The size of plant rooms that can be delivered 
is limited to about 4 metres by 4 metres by 12 metres due to road haulage restrictions. An estimated cost for a containerised plant room with a 199 kilowatt biomass boiler, buffer tank and fuel store is £100,000 including installation. These prefabricated units still require some preparation work on site, such as building a structural slab and installing pipes, control cables and an electricity supply ready for connection. In 2009 and 2010, the Scottish Government introduced a relaxation on planning controls, called Permitted Development Rights, on properties for many of the more common types of renewable technologies. This relaxed, and in some cases removed, the need for planning permission for many renewable systems. There are permitted development rights for biomass systems under 45 kW thermal. These may allow the installation of a biomass system without applying for planning permission. However, there are a number of conditions attached. Permitted development rights do not extend to listed buildings or scheduled monuments, which are covered by other planning regulations. In such cases, listed building consent is required for most works to listed buildings. Even if the biomass boiler is 45 kW thermal or less, it may not be possible to comply with the limitations associated with the permitted development, in which case planning permission would be required. There are many elements of a biomass system which can be designed for minimal visual intrusion. Boilers and fuel stores can be installed internally, provided there is sufficient space, or in external plant rooms with an attractive cladding. It is often more difficult to disguise a biomass flue. The height of the flue is determined by the boiler's requirements, and the height of surrounding buildings. It is often not possible to make a flue shorter in order that it falls within permitted development, or is visually unobtrusive, without causing operating problems, or failing to meet air quality requirements. It can be difficult to reach agreements on biomass flues in conservation areas or listed buildings, where the visual obtrusion is of particular concern, but the height of the flue cannot be reduced because of trees or buildings. So, when you are considering whether your site is suitable, consider the level of automation required for your site, the heat load to be met, i.e. do you need heat all the time or intermittently, the space required for fuel delivery and storage including safe access for lorries, space for plant and ancillary equipment, any planning issues such as listed building consent or conservation areas, and air quality issues. Is the site in an AQMA? Biomass systems can be financed both through traditional capital expenditure and through alternative arrangements such as Energy Supply Company or ESCO agreements. This section will explain the options available and the associated advantages that may arise such as maintenance being provided and the reduction of risk. Biomass boiler installations are usually more capital intensive than fossil fuel boilers because of the size and complexity of the system. The amount of money varies from £20,000 for a domestic sized installation, £150,000 or more for a 200 kilowatt pellet boiler in a prefabricated plant room, and up to £5 million or more for a new energy centre containing a multi-megawatt biomass boiler plant, flue gas treatment and fuel storage. There are two main ways in which the public sector can fund such an installation, on balance sheet or off balance sheet. We shall go through these options now. We will first look at possible financing options as on balance sheet. Internal funding. With internal funding, the organisation provides the capital for their biomass scheme. It retains full ownership of the project and all the potential benefits. At the same time, the organisation bears a considerable element of technical and financial risk. Debt finance. 
A large capital purchase is often funded by a new debt plus some internal funding. The residual technical and financial risks and the full benefits of the installation remain with the investing organisation. With new debt, it is possible to match an appropriate source of capital to a specific project. In particular, the borrowing timescale can be matched to the timescale of requirements. When an organisation obtains finance, it should bear in mind that the lender regards the loan as an investment. For every investment, there's a trade-off between risk and return. The higher the risk associated with an investment, the higher the return required on that investment. Factors influencing the perceived risk and return include the borrower's current level of debt, the credibility of the borrower's projections of project benefits, the confidence of the lender in the organisation, the confidence of the lender in the technology to be employed, the confidence of the lender in the biomass supply, the level of security that can be offered by the borrower. That's because the lender normally requires security so the amount of the loan can be recovered if the borrower runs into difficulties. And finally, the confidence of the lender in the general economic situation. Leasing. Leasing is a financial arrangement that allows an organisation to use an asset over a fixed period. There are three main types of arrangement. Hire purchase, finance lease, also known as lease or full payout lease, and operating lease, also known as off-balance sheet lease. Options for off-balance sheet financing can be arranged by two types of organisations, equipment supply organisations and energy services companies, or ESCO contractors. An equipment supply organisation may offer a leasing package where they will design, install, maintain and sometimes operate the biomass system. The host organisation will still be responsible for purchasing fuel and will buy the heat generated at the agreed price. The leasing package will normally cover at least a 10 year contract period. This approach transfers most of the technical risk from the host organisation to the equipment supplier, but the savings are also significantly lower than under a capital purchase arrangement, especially if as part of the leasing arrangement, the RHI goes to the supply organisation. In an ESCO arrangement, the product being provided to the customer is the heat generated by the biomass plant rather than the equipment. This means that it is the responsibility of the ESCO contractor to design the system, source the plant, arrange for its installation, purchase the appropriate fuel and operate the equipment to ensure that the organisation has sufficient heat. The price paid for heat is agreed at the start of the contract, but there is usually some price adjustment permitted over time to take into account inflation or fluctuations in the price of biomass fuel. It is important that an organisation purchasing low carbon heat through an ESCO arrangement is fully aware of any risks for the arrangement. These risks are usually less than if they were to purchase the system outright, but must be identified and understood. The ESCO receives a return on their investment from both the RHI and from the payments from the organisation for their heat. In both instances, the amount of money paid to the ESCO depends upon the amount of heat used by the organisation. For this reason, an ESCO contract can so often specify an amount of heat that must be purchased every year, a take or pay arrangement. It is important that an organisation considering an ESCO arrangement identifies and considers any energy savings measures that they are likely to implement over the life of the ESCO contract, which may reduce their need for heat. If these are not taken into account, then savings from improving heating controls, building insulation or other measures may not be realised, as they may be contractually obliged to pay for the heat, whether they use it or not. Therefore, it's important that such an arrangement does not prevent an organisation from implementing energy saving measures. 
One example of a source for finance for projects is the Green Investment Bank, which is a public limited company wholly owned by the UK government. It is the world's first dedicated green bank. Currently, the Green Investment Bank invests in both the public and private sectors in the areas of offshore wind, energy efficiency and waste and bioenergy. Projects in which the Green Investment Bank invests are needed to satisfy the double bottom line criteria. That is, projects must deliver not just a financial return on investment, but an environmental return as well. For example, through emission savings. Projects can receive funding either directly from the Green Investment Bank or through funding partnerships between the Green Investment Bank and other parties. One such example is a current partnership between the Green Investment Bank and Society General Equipment Finance to provide £50 million of finance for energy efficiency projects. The Green Investment Bank has a specific programme of support to finance NHS energy efficiency. This is called the Health Sector Energy Efficiency Financing Programme. The programme can help health boards finance energy efficiency measures. The Green Investment Bank has already backed a number of NHS energy efficiency programmes, including helping finance an energy innovation centre for Cambridge University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust. The new energy centre houses a combined heat and power unit, biomass boiler, efficient dual fuel boilers and heat recovery from medical incineration. Another example is Salix Finance, which is an independent, not-for-profit company funded by the Department for Energy and Climate Change, the Welsh Assembly Government and the Scottish Government. It was established in 2004 for the purposes of providing the public sector with interest-free capital funding for energy efficiency projects. Since its establishment, it has funded just over 12,000 projects to the value of just over £3 million, but delivering lifetime savings of £1.13 billion and lifetime savings of 6.2 million tonnes of CO2. In Scotland, Salix offers loans to those parties that are subject to the public body's duties in the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009. This includes the local authorities, further and higher education, the NHS and non-departmental public bodies. Funding is under the Salix Energy Efficiency Loan Scheme Fund, known as SEALS Scotland. In order to be eligible for funding, projects will need to demonstrate a payback of no more than eight years at a cost of not more than £200 per tonne of CO2 saved. Projects also need to demonstrate additionality, meaning that the proposed project will not occur without the funding. Repayment of the loan is required between four and eight years. The Scottish Government's Central Energy Efficiency Fund, or CEEF, is a key vehicle for delivering energy efficiency and small-scale renewable energy measures across the public sector in Scotland. The fund is provided by the Scottish Government and allocated to public sector organisations. CEEF funding can only be spent on measures which reduce energy consumption and carbon emissions, projects on the public sector organisation's property, or projects which have a simple payback of seven years or better for energy efficiency, or 10 years or better for renewables. We will now present three case studies on biomass boiler installations. John Wheatley College in Glasgow is heated by a biomass boiler. The boiler is fuelled by wood pellets. The pellets are delivered by lorry which parks in this area. The lorry delivers the pellets pneumatically using these metal hose connections. The pellets are blown into the fuel store. Air is displaced as the pellets are blown in and the cyclone collects any dust created. 
The pellets are moved from the fuel store to the boiler by this auger. The biomass boiler meets the base load of the site and sectional gas boilers shown here meet the peak loads. This means that the biomass boiler can operate efficiently while covering the majority of the heat load. The biomass boiler installed at John Wheatley College cleans itself. The ash is removed to a metal container shown here. The ash is fine and grey which indicates that the boiler is operating efficiently. If the ash is very brown or has unburned wood in it, then the boiler is burning inefficiently. A building management system controls the biomass boiler and the gas boilers and the associated pumps to ensure that the building always has the heat it needs. It is important that biomass sites have good access, like this, to allow fuel deliveries and maintenance to be carried out easily. Each W Energy are working with the NHS Highland on a number of biomass heat projects. The second case study is from one of their projects and the video explains the wider project and shows the installation of biomass heat cabins at Dingwall Medical Centre. NHS Highland installed a biomass heat cabin with a 90 kilowatt wood pellet boiler as part of their carbon reduction plan. My name is Andrew Sergener, I am the project engineer for HW Energy. I'm, I'm involved in the design and management of the installations for all of the NHS cabins across Scotland. This is the second installation of 10 active sites at the moment. Two sites are still under consideration. The cabins are basically adapted from structural steel cabins. The steel containers themselves actually consist of two apartments if you like. You've got the, uh, the fuel store obviously on one side, whether it be pellet or chip. And then the other side you've got effectively the plant room, which houses the main components such as the, the boilers themselves, the buffers, the pumps and all the vital components basically, to take the heat from the boiler out of the container into, the, into wherever building is required. For the Dingwall site itself, it was, um, it was estimated they were, they were generally using about maybe £10,000 per annum on the existing oil bill. This is obviously due to the existing boilers not being very efficient. So the cost savings going on to the pellet, it, it works out approximately probably about 40% savings. Um, another way to put it in perspective ratio is that on the pellet it costs them approximately 5.5p per kilowatt hour. Whereas opposed with the oil, they were paying maybe nine pence per kilowatt hour. So the over the year that does accumulate obviously, and then you've got the added advantage of the IHO tire, which comes in at 8.6 pence per kilowatt hour, added on top of that saving. So it is quite generous. In this part of the module, we will look at how you can go about developing the business case to support a biomass system. The cost of operating a biomass boiler can be lower than the cost of operating a fossil fuel boiler. There can be cost savings from using biomass fuels, but the income from the RHI will make the business case significantly more attractive. However, it's important to also consider the additional cost of operating a biomass boiler, including the operation and maintenance costs. These key issues will be discussed in more detail next. The price of biomass is highly dependent upon the transport cost. It is usually uneconomic to transport fuel more than 50 miles from a depot. Many suppliers give discounts for larger deliveries. For example, pellet deliveries of 10 tonnes or more. These prices are an indication only. Transportation costs and the amount of notice provided to a supplier will also have a significant effect on the price of fuel. 
The Renewable Heat Incentive is a government scheme which makes a payment for generating heat from a renewable resource. This table shows the amount of money paid for each unit of heat depending upon the boiler used, with the tariff correct as of 1st of July 2014. For smaller biomass boilers, the RHI tariffs are tiered. This means that a lower rate is paid for each unit of heat beyond a set amount. In each year, the Tier 1 tariff is paid until the system has operated up to 15% of the annual rated output, i.e. the equivalent of 1,314 hours at the rated capacity of the installation. For the rest of the output in the year, the Tier 2 tariff will apply. When a boiler is being sized, it is worth considering the structure of the RHI tariffs to ensure that the financial benefits of biomass are optimised. It is important not to oversize the boiler, however, as this may cause problems highlighted in the maintenance section. Biomass boilers need regular maintenance. The maintenance cost will depend upon who carries out the maintenance and how the biomass boiler is operated. An oversized boiler will incur higher maintenance costs compared to a correctly sized unit. Operation and maintenance costs are lower for chip systems than pellet systems, but can be of a similar order to O&M systems for mains gas and heavy fuel oil. The greatest part of this cost is the annual fuel cost, but maintenance is important and will include annual maintenance or servicing and routine labour costs. We are now going to work through a short quiz. You should use the information that you have learned so far in this session to help you to answer each of the six questions that follows. Which type of biomass fuel can most easily be delivered, stored and transported to the boiler without manual handling? Is it A. Wood logs, B. Wood chips, C. Wood pellets or D. Straw bales? The answer is wood pellets. The entire fuel delivery and storage mechanism can be completely automated. Wood chip systems can be automated, but they require significantly more machinery. What aspects of fuel composition can impact the efficiency of combustion? Is it A, the physical size of the fuel, B, the energy density of the fuel, C. The ash content of the fuel or D. The moisture content of the fuel? The answer is B, C and D. Ash in the fuel may result in clinkering, slagging and fouling. It will be important to ensure that the boiler is designed to handle the fuel characteristics. What aspect of biomass fuel does the biomass suppliers list accredit? Is it A. Greenhouse gas emissions B. Moisture content C. Amount and type of ash generated or D. All of the above The answer is A. Greenhouse gas emissions The biomass suppliers list is one way of confirming that the fuel you burn is sustainable. Which type of wood fuel can be certified against European standards? Is it A. Wood logs, B. Miscanthus bales, C. Waste wood chips, or D. Wood pellets? The answer is D. Wood pellets, which are available to EN plus A1 and A2 standards. Question 5. What issues are important in storing biomass fuel? Is it A. The moisture content of the fuel? B. The ease of transport of fuel to the boiler. Is it C. The rate of use of fuel. Or D. Handling of the fuel. The answer is all of the above. The moisture content of the fuel will impact on degradation of the fuel in store and may cause self-heating. The ease of transport to the boiler will impact ease of use and costs. The rate of use of fuel dictates the storage required. 
and poor handling of fuel may result in dust and other health and safety issues. Question 6. Which of the following must be considered when sizing a buffer tank or thermal store? Is it A, the biomass boiler size? B, the heat profile of the building? C, the fuel used? Or D, the control system? The answer is A, B and D. The buffer tank performs a vital role ensuring that the boiler efficiency is as high as possible and in ensuring that the biomass boiler meets as much of the heat load as possible. Question 7. Which of the following does not need to be considered when determining the peak heat load of a building? Is it A. Interior and external temperatures B. Building values C. Ventilation losses D. Internal gains or E. Thermal bridging the answer is E, internal gains. The internal gains must be considered when determining how the requirement for heat changes over time, but the peak heat loss should be calculated when there is no heat being generated from other sources. Question 7. How does the RHI determine the number of kilowatt hours on which incentive is paid at Tier 1? Is it A, the total annual heating requirement of the building? Is it B, the peak heat load of the building in kilowatts multiplied by 1,314? Is it C, the output of the biomass boiler in kilowatts multiplied by 1,314? Or D, the total heat used in the first year of operation? The answer is C, the output of the biomass boiler in kilowatts multiplied by 1,314. That concludes this e-module. Hopefully this has provided you with some ideas for heat generation using biomass.